I'm Patrick. I'm Adam. And this is Clock, Stock, and, and Barrel. Barrel. Coming at you with another New York Minute episode. Today we're here to speak with Nick Pardo of yeah. Analog Shift. Um, awesome guy, you met him at a party? Yeah, at a party. At a, at a, yeah, we were at a strip club, you know, at 3 a.m. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. And, and he just, mentioned that, I'm like, and he was get wearing, his number? He was wearing an AP Royal Oak and Rose Gold, <laughs> and I was wearing my Hublot. Classy, classy, you know, you gotta do it right. <laughs> Um, but Nick's actually waiting for us now to do this interview, so we're not going to take up too much of his time. Um, Adam and I are actually in the space now. Uh, we can't reveal where this location is. However, if you are interested in buying their timepieces, I'll encourage you to check out the website. Also, their Instagram. We've got a bunch of photos up of watches for sale. Uh, a lot of great um, secondhand watches. I mean, yeah. there's the collection here. You're going to see some images in a second, but it's ridiculous. Very cool place, guys. So, without further ado, here is the interview with Nick of Analog Shift. Uh, so my name is Nick Pardo. I'm a senior timepiece specialist at Analog Shift here in New York. Um, what that really means is uh, I primarily deal with sales and uh, procurement of our vintage watches. Um, I also happen to manage uh, our service process for our inventory and things like that. Um, and then of course we're a small company so occasional uh, other projects pop up here and there. Uh, the way I ended up here is I actually started a website called 1025 Vintage a couple of years ago. Uh, I started that company independently and since has become part of the Analog Shift family. I was working here uh, part-time with the team and now I'm, I've been here full-time for a little while. I wish I had a single like perfect moment to be like, oh this is it. I've just always had watches, I've always worn them. I remember getting um, a Timex Iron Man when I was seven. And then uh, I also actually, for my seventh birthday, alternate, uh, got a Looney Tunes watch, which my mother recently found and gave back to me. Nice. Um, so I have my heirloom watch, my chrome-plated quartz <laughs> Looney Tunes watch with all the characters on the dial. I have that at home. I think what rekindled it as an adult, really, was uh, when I graduated college and I went to work. I hated being the young person checking my cell phone for the time, and so I told my girlfriend at the time that I really needed a watch, and uh, I got one, and it kind of started this whole thing. After a little bit of time collecting more modern pieces, kind of entry-level automatics and things like that, I learned that vintage watches were a thing, and as soon as I bought my first one, which was at Benris, um, uh, Benris DTU 2AP, so 1965 Vietnam era uh, GI watch. Once I got that, I remember thinking, putting it on my wrist and going, wow, this is kind of small. And then the next day going, this is the most perfect watch that has ever existed and I sold everything else and I am exclusively 100% vintage <laughs> since then. I've always had a, something of an entrepreneurial bent, I guess. Uh, I've, always, I've had a couple of fits and starts throughout the years, always kind of looking for a new project and a side project or a side business that I could build out. Uh, and when I started collecting when I started my vintage collection, I was focusing kind of on a more affordable price point, really. You know, I had a lot of Seikos and things like that, and I thought, like, nobody was really kind of giving those watches the love that they deserved, right? right? And really kind of focusing exclusively on that price point and on that, those styles. And that's where 1025 Vintage was kind of born. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's all been kind of like an organic process since then, right? The company to, uh, started, um, I got to know the team here at Analog Shift, and I've always long admired them. Um, in fact, my initial business model was basically just to copy them. And so uh, this has always been a very long-standing admiration for the team here. Um, and so I've been very lucky that over time I'm now part of that team. Um, it really kind of speaks to uh, you know the, the quality of the team here especially. So Analog Shift really came about because of uh, a lot of dissatisfaction I think about how the vintage space runs um, and how it exists. I think it's uh, been the same way for a very long time. It has this connotation of kind of like 47th Street jewelry, guys with coats and stuff like that and we really didn't like that. We wanted to um, our, t our founder, James, really wanted to approach it in a very authentic, very straightforward way, really finding exceptional watches and telling their stories. And that's really kind of what brought all of us here, you know? Um, again, that's how I came into it. I, I you know, thought there was a better way, really. Um, and so that's the shared belief that we have here. We really try to think of ourselves, I think, a little bit as treasure hunters and really try to find really exceptional pieces 
um, and tell the stories. And when I say the stories, I don't just mean the watch itself. We really try to zoom out a little bit and think not just about the watch, right, but the, the technical things that went into it, the design, the engineering, and then the time, the history, and, and really like what was going on in the world at the time. You know, thinking about things like the jet age, right? All of a sudden, transatlantic travel right. is a thing. So what does that mean for technology and for watches by extension? And really kind of try to tell all those stories as authentically as possible. Yeah, so the majority of our inventory comes pretty much from within our existing network, from past clients, friends of clients, kind of, uh, you know, uh, collectors who know of us. Um, so we're lucky in that regard that we uh, already have... Um, you know, really strong pieces that, that even come our way. Uh, from there, once they're kind of in-house, um, everything, we will do any kind of homework and research that's necessary to kind of uh, confirm consistency and authenticity of parts. Uh, we've got a ton of really amazing books and reference materials, um, depending on what, what the watch is, so that we can really kind of, we want to be 100% confident. We'll reach out to anybody that we really need to if something looks right. just not quite right. Um, Beyond that, we'll also send everything to our watchmakers for inspection, make sure all the parts are looking good, there's nothing, uh, there's nothing hacked together or frankened in there um, or anything. And then uh, at that point, any service that gets needed uh, gets done to it. You know, we try to we stand behind everything we sell. So I don't want to sell a watch; it's going to come back in a month because the chronograph doesn't run. I would much rather just get it serviced uh, to, ahead of time. Right. Um, and really, you know, we, we take a lot of pride in every watch that we sell. In terms of the future, I mean, we're really in growth mode right now. Uh, we're really looking at getting more watches, but also expanding into, into other areas. We're looking into content and accessories and all kinds of things uh, for the future. Uh, so really stay tuned. We've got a ton of exciting announcements coming up over the next couple of months and, and years. So uh, we've, got a, we've got a big plan to uh, do some really great things. So what I have on my wrist today and have had on my wrist for the last week, I'm completely smitten by this, is an IWC Mark 11 pilot's watch uh, from 1948. This particular one is nicknamed the White 12 variant, which refers to the first execution dial and hands. Um, they're extremely rare because uh, essentially in the early 50s, the Mark 11s uh, were sent back from the, uh, from the field uh, to have the dials replaced with ones that were easier to see in, at night. Um, based on feedback from pilots, and then a couple years later they actually had tritium added onto the dial. This has neither of those, um, so it kind of goes to reason that it never made it back um, to the Ministry of Defense or to IWC. Um, for that reason, they're extremely rare, uh, very, very cool. I'm a big fan of military pilots' watches in general. I have a later kind of a 60s Hamilton variant of this watch. Um, so this is kind of like the, uh, the end game for that style of watch, in, in my opinion. Um, so. I love it. Yeah, it looks I'm fantastic. I'm wrist. not joking. I haven't taken it off in a week. I usually change yeah. watches twice a day. I, it's funny. My own. Maybe I'm a little spoiled because I get to wear cool watches all the time. My own collection is actually relatively small. It's only uh, about eight pieces. I have an eight slot watch box, and I do the. I try to stick to the one in one mm. out policy. It's so been a little hazy recently. <laughs> With that said, I. I I am the style, there are different styles of collectors, so there's no kind of, uh, you know, uh, there's no great philosophies that I can share uh, necessarily. Some guys have uh, got to have them all, they just got to buy everything and they don't care if they have nine watches that look exactly the same. I am, um, I'm actually a little bit more of a focused collector. I tend to be somebody who, I don't really buy on impulse, I tend to get into a particular model or a particular style of watch and then kind of look for a really, really great example of it. Yeah. Um, and then in, and in certain styles, it's kind of like you get one and then you get like a slightly better version of it and a slightly better version of it. Right. And kind of, but without having, I don't want to have nine pilots watches. I want to have, I have one right now. I want to get maybe a later Mark 11 and then, a, and then eventually maybe move up to something like and this. And find right? the so, best example. And find the best that. example or like the rare, not necessarily the rarest, but the one that speaks to me the most. Um, that's my style of collecting. Um, you know, I've seen all kinds of people come in here, different, different things. You know, people who only, cut, you know, they want every kind of Speedmaster, you know, that's not, that's not how I do things. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's a highly personal thing, I think. For me, I think uh, I do think this IWC kind of uh, white 12 Mark 11 is uh, an elusive beast, and I think it fits right into my collection. Uh, I think it will be there one day. 
Uh, I think for a Speedmaster, um, I currently have a 145-02269, a straight riding commemorative edition. I think eventually that's going to become a pre-moon and then hopefully a straight lug Speedmaster one day. Um, I think those are the two that really, really speak to me. I also have a couple of oddball Seiko wishes, like I want to turn my, uh, I have a blue Pogue 6139. I think eventually I do want to get like a super early serial number, like a February 1969, and that's not crazy amounts of money or anything like that. It's just something that I'm, it's going to be really hard to find and I really want to hunt it down. Uh, I think those would be kind of like some pieces that I would like to would like to build towards. Uh, believe it or not, I'm not the biggest like uh, big crown submariner guy or anything like that. I mean, I, I think they're very cool, but not uh, not necessarily with me. I do also really really want a really good 1675 GMT though. I've, I I I don't consider myself a Rolex guy, but I think I'm becoming a GMT guy. If that makes any <laughs> nice sense. Little, little guilty dial. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, really what we're doing here is we're trying to help people kind of come into this community and grow as collectors and really like to share our, we're all passionate collectors here and we're really here to share kind of our knowledge and our expertise and save people some time and, you know, really get exceptional pieces um, on everybody's wrist and, you know, we're not here to make a quick buck, you know, we're, we're here for the long haul and really to build relationships and bring more people into the, bring more people into the hobby. Plus you get a warranty. <laughs> well, hello there. Hello. How are you? Uh, guys, we just finished up with Nick. I'm gonna grab food. Nick's grabbing food. We're not grabbing food together. We're not that close yet. Maybe we will be. Um, Adam? Uh, I'll be going home. Probably going home. <laughs> Did you see the watches? Did you see the watches in that location? Um, there's some really great stuff there. They have such an awesome oh, yeah. inventory. Um, so again, much cool memorabilia too. A lot, oh of, lot of cool shit. Yeah, I hope that you got uh, a feel for this space just through some of that B-roll. Uh, if not, uh, Nick actually encourages serious buyers to drop by, uh, as, he, as he mentioned. Yeah, you guys are welcome to go see the space. I mean, like, you, you saw it was absolutely beautiful. Yeah. Just shoot him an email if you're interested in, uh, in seeing any pieces or potentially buying any. Um, and then he'll shoot you the, uh, the actual address because we don't want to disclose that right now. Obviously, for for obvious reasons, right? That but email. Oh, what the address? No. Yeah, yeah. Address? No, because we doesn't want everyone going there at once. Right. However, you can shoot an email to Nick at nick at analogshift.com. Pretty easy to remember. It's just his name at analogshift.com. He'd be happy, as he mentioned to us earlier, to respond to any of those emails. He's pretty receptive. He's been responding to ours very, Absolutely. very efficiently. So thank you, Nick, and thank you, Analog Shift, for having us in today. We had a blast. <sighs> Too many watches I want that I saw that I'm just, I cannot do right now. That are multiple, multiple, multiple times our bake counts. <laughs> we just did a grail video. I literally saw my grail diver in that store. So there's a lot of stuff there for you if you're a serious collector. Do check them out. Um, also check out their Instagram. We'll provide links to everything down below. But anyway, guys, yeah. if you like this video, hit that like button. If you disliked it, that is okay too. Um, you can hit that button, but if you dislike it, that means you don't like vintage watches. And there's something wrong with you. And we're both you. wearing vintage we're watches. We're both wearing vintage watches right now. Um, guys, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. I think at this point we have 2,000 subscribers. That's awesome. Yep. Um, at least of the recording of this. So thank you so much, guys, for, for joining us. We're a little late to the party, but you're still subscribing. We appreciate it. Uh, at this point, guys, we're going to head off. Thank you again, and we'll see you later. So, yeah, so this is the um, IWC Mark... Uh, Mark 11 White 12, so Royal Air Force issued pilot's watch from 1948. Um, most distinctive feature here is it's got a um, a 12, an actual Arabic number 12 uh, at 12 o'clock rather than the distinctive IWC triangle. The handset is also a little bit different. It's got kind of pencil sword hands um, as opposed to the distinctive kind of like stubby hour hand um, that comes on the later on the later iterations. Uh, nice 36 millimeter case, manual wind caliber 89 movement. Uh, caliber 89 is recognized, you know, pretty well known to be uh, possibly one of the finest three hand movements ever made. Uh, incredibly accurate, incredibly robust. Um, later went on to power many, many pieces for IWC after the war. Um, and of course, like any other proper military watch, the best part um, on the case back, uh, the um, Ministry of Defense engravings, including the broad arrow, um, the year of issue and serial number. This is a uh, reference 29983. 
um, you know, in the pre-professional model. So it's got a straight lug case, a caliber 321, dot over 90 bezel. Um, the really interesting thing is kind of in the uh, in this era, in that straight lug era in particular, there were a lot of different sub-references. There were a lot of kind of like experiments with handsets and different designs. This has these beautiful, beautiful alpha hands um, on the main chronograph, on the main hands, and then also on the chronograph. Uh, you'll see the little leaf hands in there. Again, 38 millimeter straight lug case, uh, wears a little bit uh, slimmer than the twisted lug case that everybody is familiar with. Cool thing about this one, I think we're on a little bit of an engravings kick here um, because it does have the, um, the original owner hand engraved uh, his name onto the back. What we're looking at here is a uh, 1940s Universal Genève tri-compacts. Um, tri-compacts refers to the three different functions that the watch has. So it actually has a triple chronograph, a triple calendar, and a moon phase indicator. Um, the real standout uh, thing about this particular watch is the size, it's 38 millimeters, so quite oversized for the era. Um, it's an exceptional condition, uh, but really the story here is actually the case back, uh, which has this beautiful engraving. Um, it says, from Fred B to Fred K, uh, July 1948. So what we're looking at here is a um, late 1960s, early 70s Yamaha Rally. Um, what's cool about these is um, it's got a 37, 38 millimeter straight lug case, actually very reminiscent of the early straight lug Speedmasters, um, but it's really all about this dial. Um, you know, with a name like Rally, there's kind of no hiding what it's about. It has racing stripes on the dial. Um, the coolest thing about these is actually there's a famous photo of Mario Andretti in the late 60s wearing one of these. Uh, you can tell it what it is from a mile away. Um, so it's really cool that you can get a watch with a pretty legitimate motorsports connection, both uh, kind of aesthetically and historically, um, at, a, at a pretty aggressive price point. These are only a couple thousand dollars compared to, for example, the Andretti Hoyers or um, the uh, Sifford Octavias and things like that.